and uh, we're working through the Chronicles, and uh, this is a very famous chapter. Second Chronicles 9 is the visit of the Queen of Sheba to Solomon. Now, we've been working through the Chronicles. We've said uh, we need to remember that the Chronicles was written <coughs> about 450 B.C., so in the history of Israel, this is after uh, many have come back from Babylon. Uh, Babylon has been destroyed by the Persians and Cyrus the Persian made the decree that the peoples can go back and so many have come back, they've come back to Jerusalem, the temple has been rebuilt and um, they do have a governor. Uh, the governor is actually of the royal house of David, Zerubbabel and, uh, and, and so on. But they don't have a king. But the chronicler is writing at this time to remind them of the way things were. It's a time of looking forward. What will God do? What will God do with us uh, as a people, as a nation? Um, what's he going to do in the future? Uh, what, what can we hope for? What can we pray for? And so, and so the chronicler is going back to what happened, what was the case, what God had done in the past, what he had promised. This is what we saw in 1 Chronicles, which, which focuses on that great promise to David, which is a promise for the nation of Israel. And uh, wonderful promises of the blessings on the house of David, a future king uh, who will reign forever. A, a line of kings in the meantime if they walk with God. And so here we are following the story and we're at that son of David, Solomon, and his reign. And what we've seen is that it's fantastic. The blessing of God upon the nation is beyond what anybody could think or expect or hope. Now, what I would like to do is, first of all, just read through this chapter with you, okay? And then we're going to go back and look at it and talk about it. Let me do this. I brought a different translation with me, so I'm going to just take, a, which is a reminder, we have the translation that's on the screen here on the handout. And you can follow along, make notes as you wish. So 2 Chronicles 9, starting in verse 1. The queen of Sheba heard of Solomon's fame. Let me just take a moment here to put the geography clear in your mind. Sheba, or Saba, um, was the area of about present-day Yemen. So we're at the, the southern end of the Arabian Peninsula, okay, which is right across from Ethiopia. So uh, you come down from Israel, you already know that Solomon had a port on the Gulf of Aqaba, and the Gulf of Aqaba feeds into the Red Sea. And so they could, with ships, come down uh, southwest down the Gulf of Aqaba to the Red Sea going south and then you're following with the Arabian Peninsula on your left as you're headed south and Africa on your right so you're coming down south you come down to the southernmost tip there of the Arabian Peninsula where present-day Yemen is and that's where Saba, uh, Sheba uh, was located and that's where this queen is from. It's about 1,500 miles from Jerusalem. Okay. The queen of Sheba heard of Solomon's fame. So she came to test Solomon with difficult questions at Jerusalem. With a very large entourage with camels bearing spices, gold in abundance, and precious stones. She came to Solomon and spoke with him about everything that was on her mind. So Solomon answered all her questions. Nothing was too difficult for Solomon to explain to her. 
When the Queen of Sheba observed Solomon's wisdom, the palace he had built, the food at his table, his servants, residence, his attendants, service, and their attire, his cupbearers and their attire, the burnt offerings he offered at the Lord's temple, it took her breath away. She said to the king, the report I heard in my own country about your words and about your wisdom is true, but I didn't believe their reports until I came and saw with my own eyes. Indeed, I was not even told half of your great wisdom. You far exceed the report I heard. How happy are your men. How happy are these servants of yours who always stand in your presence hearing your wisdom. May the Lord your God be praised. He delighted in you and put you on his throne as king for the Lord your God because your God loved Israel enough to establish them forever. He has set you over them as king to carry out justice and righteousness. Then she gave the king four and a half tons of gold, a great quantity of spices and precious stones. There never were such spices as those the Queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. In addition, Hiram's servants and Solomon's servants who brought gold from Orpher also brought algam wood and precious stones. The king made algam wood into walkways for the Lord's temple and for the king's palace and into lyres and harps for the singers. Never before had anything like them been seen in the land of Judah. King Solomon gave the Queen of Sheba her every desire, whatever she asked, far more than she had brought the king. Then she, along with her servants, returned to her own country. The weight of gold <clears throat> that came to Solomon annually was 25 tons. Besides what was brought by the merchants and traders, all the Arabian kings and governors, you get that? Arabian kings? All the kings of the Arabs and governors of the land brought gold and silver to Solomon. King Solomon made 200 large shields of hammered gold. 15 pounds of hammered gold went into each shield. He made 300 small shields of hammered gold. About 8 pounds of gold went into each shield. The king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. The king also made a large ivory throne and overlaid it with pure gold. The throne had six steps. There was a footstool covered in gold for the throne. Armrests on either side of the seat, two lions standing besides the armrests. Twelve lions were standing there on the six steps, one on each end. Nothing like it had ever been seen, had ever been made in any other kingdom. All of King Solomon's drinking cups were gold. All the utensils of the house of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. There was no silver since it was considered as nothing in Solomon's time. For the king's ships kept going to Tarshish with Hiram's servants, and once every three years the ships of Tarshish would arrive bearing gold, silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. King Solomon surpassed all the kings of the world in riches and wisdom. All the kings of the world wanted an audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom God had put in his heart. Each of them would bring his own gift, items of silver and gold, clothing, weapons, spices, horses, mules, as an annual tribute. Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots, 12,000 horsemen. He stationed them in the chariot cities and with the king in Jerusalem. He ruled over all the kings from the Euphrates River to the land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt. You'll recognize that as the borders of the promised land. The king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones. He made cedar as abundant as sycamore in the Judean foothills. They were bringing horses for Solomon from Egypt and from all the countries. The remaining events of Solomon's reign from beginning to end are written in the events of Nathan the prophet, the prophecy of Ahijah the Shilonite, the visions of Iddo the seer concerning Jeroboam son of Nebat. Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel for 40 years. Solomon rested with his fathers, was buried in the city of his father David. He and his son, Rehob his son Rehoboam became king in his place. Okay, what's the impression you get from this? 
Gold and silver. Gold and silver. <laughs> I mean, lots, wealth. Lots. lots and lots and lots of wealth. Silver is just nothing. Okay. So we have gold cups, we have gold plates, we eat on gold because silver is just nothing. I mean, there's so much wealth that's coming in here. So here's the point. <clears throat> uh, wealth is a theme in this chapter. But there's also the theme of wisdom. And the question that the chapter is directing you to is the relationship between wisdom and wealth. Wealth and wisdom. Now let's just follow it here. We'll comment on it. And <clears throat> what I want to do is kind of comment through the chapter. And then I want to take you to another uh, part of the Bible written by Solomon that speaks of the thing that we're seeing in here. Okay? So here we are back at verse 1. The Queen of Sheba, <clears throat> she's down there in Saba, Sheba, and here's a Solomon, and she comes. It says that she came to test Solomon with difficult questions. The word questions is also the word for riddles. Um, one of the commentators said, this is, you see this in uh, Semitic cultures, for example, in uh, um, Arab cultures today, that uh, uh, sometimes in the, the conversational hospitality that there may be these kinds of, I don't know, this kind of questioning, this kind of mental testing that goes on here. Uh, she comes up and she's testing him uh, with all kinds of questions because she's heard about him and uh, how wise he is. Notice that she comes, it says, with a very large entourage with camels bearing spices, gold in abundance, precious stones. So she doesn't travel by ship. She comes by caravan uh, up 1,500 miles here from the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula. Now, uh, Sheba or Saba, it's, you find it different ways here, um, was very well known for trade. Where they were located, um, they basically at a point connecting to the east, going, you know, headed, you know, you come up the, the land route and you're coming um, up into the uh, Euphrates River Valley right at the mouth of the river. Uh, we're present day Iraq and you've got Iran, Iraq and so on and you're headed over toward India. So uh, they're on a trade route basically and they're very famous for trading in um, frankincense and myrrh. Um, they, uh, which was very expensive and frankincense um, could be traded like gold. And they're, they're a very wealthy area, but they're very big time into trade. What's happened here in the text is that <laughs> Solomon, by consolidating uh, Israel and the rule in Israel, uh, he occupies a key position in the trade routes. Um, Hiram is up in Tyre. And you know that Solomon has a business relationship with Hiram of Tyre. Tyre, with Tyre you have the entire trade of the Mediterranean. The Phoenicians, basically, they owned the, the sea trade all the way out to present day Spain. Um, so all of those countries, you know, Tyre had that down. Solomon basically is sitting there on the trade routes between east and west. And he has <coughs> taken control of all of those trade routes. And he has developed a partnership with Tyre for sea trade going down to Africa, uh, out of the, uh, the port uh, there at Ezion Geber. Uh, there at the um, mouth of the uh, Gulf of Aqaba. So, um, so he is in a key position. So she 
uh, has to trade with him in order to connect to the big lucrative trade going to the West. Okay? Um, and so, so anyway, as she uh, comes up with this caravan with lots of goods, and this is the kind of stuff, some of this, the spices and so on, is what she trades in. And uh, so she came to test him. I mean, this, she's coming here as a head of state <clears throat> to another head of state. Uh, and uh, basically, you're developing trade parts. Very interesting in our history right now in our nation. Our president, as the head of our state, uh, is very much into trade. <laughs> and, uh, and he's engaging uh, leaders of other countries for the purpose of economic trade. Well, put it in that context. Here is the head of this state testing, and you got to know who you're dealing with, do you not? Uh, you got to take the measure of the man. You got to take the measure of the trade partner. Okay, that, that tells you a lot of things, you know, how you're going to proceed here. So she comes checking him out, testing him, and uh, with difficult questions, anything that she thinks of. And Solomon answered all her questions. Nothing was too difficult for Solomon to explain to her. This is the Solomon we know of in the Bible. This is the Solomon who asked God for wisdom, and God has given him wisdom, and he has this wisdom, and he's able to answer her questions. He's able, look, <clears throat> Wisdom is not just answers to questions. Wisdom <clears throat> is how to conduct life in all its variety. Personal, business, professional, familial, social, political. It's the conduct of life. Wisdom in the Bible is, is successful living relationships. And so when she's testing him, she's observing him and how he's handling things, how he speaks of things. Uh, not just how do you, what's the answer to this riddle, but how do you deal with people? And in when she asks questions like this, she's also observing him. And this is what we see as, as the text goes on. When the Queen of Sheba observed Solomon's wisdom, the palace he had built. <clears throat> Actually, that's probably not the best word there. The word palace is literally the word house. And it's probably not referring to his own palace. It's probably referring to the temple. When she observed his wisdom in the house that he had built, the food at his table, his servants' residence. Now, look at what she's observing here. <clears throat> the food at his table. What is this? This is a banquet, all right? So this is a, a state banquet, right? We have a visiting head of state, and so we have a state banquet here. Uh, and she watches, she, she sees how the banquet is handled, she sees, and, and she's watching everything. I think she's also uh, seeing how, um, how things are normally with respect to how things are uh, in the state festivities. She sees the food at his table. <clears throat> What kind of food? And the abundance of it. Uh, you ever go to uh, a banquet sometime and you kind of have your hopes up and, and you get this little chicken sandwich? <laughs> <laughs> and then you think, well, maybe the program's good, you know? <laughs> and maybe the program will be good, you know? But you kind of, it's kind of disappointing, you know? You, you're kind of looking for something good, you know, maybe a steak. I mean, you have some nice steak at the bank, but you're impressed, okay? 
but she's impressed by the food and so on that's there. And his servant's residence. How does he treat his servants? Uh, how are they doing? Where do they live? And his attendance service, the way they serve. You ever notice an organization, when you're evaluating an organization, look how people behave, how the people in the organization behave, what their attitude is. Uh, you can tell, you know, if you have an organization where people are serving with joy and, you know, they love to be there, they love to work there, you know, other places where, you know, you know, they, they're just enduring. This is what she's looking at. You see, because <clears throat> the way the servants, their attitude and so on, that, that says something about wisdom, the way he treats them, the way he's running the organization. <clears throat> These are things you need to know if you're going to do business with somebody, right? I don't know what kind of organization this is and what kind of what we're dealing with here. Notice she looks at the attendant's attire, <laughs> how they dressed. Nothing escapes her evaluation here. The cupbearers and their attire. The burnt offerings he offered at the Lord's temple. And we've read about that last week, the thousands. Of course, that was a 14-day <clears throat> festival in which he's feeding everybody that's come from the very north to the very south of Israel that's come to Jerusalem. So the big feasting going on there, but the lots of offerings even had to make a, an extra uh, altar in order to do this. But when she sees all of this, it took her breath away. Not only the magnitude, the sheer magnitude of the food and all that kind of thing, but the quality and how well, how well everything was running. Okay. Was this a seven star restaurant? Uh, yeah, it would have been. <laughs> seven stars. And all the evaluation from the staff were seven star. Okay, so. <laughs> she said to the king, the report I heard in my own country about your words and about your wisdom is true, but I didn't believe their reports until I came and saw with my own eyes. Indeed, I was not even told half of your great wisdom. You far exceed the report I heard. Again, remember, the wisdom is not just can you answer a riddle. The wisdom is how you are <coughs> conducting everything, how you are running everything. Okay. How happy are your men? And some of the translations, the translators have changed that to women. But the text actually says men. Mankind. Uh, well, what she's referring to, it, it's, the thing of it is in, in tradition, let's, let's just answer this question, all right? In, in tradition, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of tradition, a lot of myth that's developed around Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. I mean, when Hollywood gets a hold of this, I mean, it goes in a whole different direction. But some of that is because actually in in uh, tradition, there have been traditions about this. For example, uh, the Ethiopians consider uh, their, their country, their, their people to have developed from the child of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. That's their tradition, they say that. Okay? And there is actually a Jewish tradition that says that uh, they had children and that that's where Nebuchadnezzar ends up coming from. I mean, there's all kinds of wild myths. But the text does not present that that way. And so this is not a domestic comment here. This is a, a state comment. This is from a head of state. And by the way, it was very common to have <coughs> queens from that area, okay, as heads of state in Arabia at that time in the 10th century and in the 9th century BC. And now even down into uh, toward the 7th century BC, there are reports 
of um, queens as heads of state down there, okay? So, when she says, how happy are your men, I think this is a comment on the, the people. Uh, and the people especially around him who serve him uh, and the people of Israel. How happy are these servants of yours who always stand in your presence hearing your wisdom. Now look, <laughs> anybody who's head of a company, you, know, you always have people, you know, in your employee and, you know, always telling you you're great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're great, you know. They, they're not stupid, so they're, <laughs> they're telling you how great you are, you know. <clears throat> but I think that she's able to see the difference between the, the feigned um, employment type of conversation <clears throat> and a real um, heartfelt relationship. And it's not they hear Solomon's wisdom, but they are recipients. They are beneficiaries of his wisdom, the way he runs the organization. May the Lord your God, look at this verse 8. <clears throat> Verses, verse 8 is key. Uh, and it's coming out of the mouth of this Gentile who has come all the way to see him. And she says, may the Lord your God be praised. He delighted in you. And he put you on his throne as king for the Lord your God. Because your God loved Israel enough to establish them forever. He has set you over them as king to carry out justice and righteousness. The phrase justice and righteousness applied to the king appears only two other times in the Bible. It appears it's applied to David in 1 Chronicles 18, that he ruled with justice and righteousness. And it's applied to the future Messiah in Jeremiah 32, looking forward to the righteous branch who will rule in justice and righteousness and here to Solomon. But didn't that come from Jeremiah 31, 31, the new covenant? I mean, progressive revelation? Well, the new covenant speaks of how that righteousness is going to come into the lives of the people. God puts his law right into their heart. But you're going to have a king who rules. That's love back then, I guess, is where you're. You're going to have a king. God by Hasid, the love. Yeah. You're going to have a king that rules in righteousness and justice. Well, the point is that when we go forward from here in Chronicles, we're going to go down a line of kings, and of none of them is this set. It's set of David, it's set of Solomon. Okay. And it's coming out of the mouth of this Gentile. The, the very fact that she comes all the way down here from Sheba or Saba, uh, Jesus makes reference to her trip in Matthew 12. And he refers to her coming from the ends of the earth. Uh, he says in Matthew 12, the queen of Sheba came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. So you have to have that picture in your mind, a Gentile coming from the ends of the earth. If you put that in prophecy, prophecy speaks of the nations coming to Jerusalem. They come to learn the word of the Lord. They come to learn the law of the Lord. They come to learn the wisdom of God. And where is it coming from? It's coming through the mind, the life, the work, the practice of a king. So here she is saying she's come and she's seen it, that God has put this wisdom there, in a ruler, there, in that place. Then she gave the king four and a half tons of gold and a great quantity of spices and precious stones. There were never such spices as those the Queen of Sheba gave to Solomon. That's what they traded in. Uh, they had trade with spices uh, going all the way to India. They had things that had not been seen, you know, on, in the uh, western lands. And so basically well, she's establishing a trading relationship. This is the kind of thing that we can do, all right? <laughs> uh, 
And uh, so she, she gives these spices, and there is the gift of this gold. Four and a half tons of gold, that's a nice gift. <laughs> Now, at this point, the chronicler, thinking about that gold, uh, is thinking about Hiram of Tyre. And, uh, and so he mentions here, Hiram's servants and Solomon's servants brought gold from Orpher. We've already told this in the text, that they've got, they've got these ships going down to Orpher, which is in Africa. And they're mining gold down there. Uh, but uh, he decides at this time to also mention this, that there's this algum wood. Now, we don't know what algum wood was. There's been a lot of study of it. We don't know. Okay. Sycamore, what, what, whatever, whatever yeah. the wood was. It was whatever good. Whatever grew. It was good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> whatever it was. And the point <clears throat> that he's making is emphasizing the wealth. The king made the algum wood into walkways for the Lord's temple and the king's palace. So you're coming up, <clears throat> you, as you're approaching the temple, you have these wooden walkways and over to the king's palace. I mean, the streets are just, you know, streets. And I mean, these are ancient times. Uh, they don't have modern paving. But when you'd come up to the king's palace and the temple, you had this wooden paving out of this exotic wood. And notice that he says at the end of here, never before had anything like that been seen. What is this? He's emphasizing the wealth. Um, also, they use this wood to make lyres and harps and so on. Never before, never before had that been seen. King Solomon gave the Queen of Sheba her every desire, whatever she asked, far more than she had brought to the king. So there is a sense of she gives this, these gifts, he gives these gifts, so she gives these spices, he gives whatever he trades in and so on. And so there is this, this trade. But she comes away with even more. After all, she's come 1,500 miles uh, here one way and headed back 1,500 miles. And so the impression that he leaves upon her is that she comes away with even more than she brought. Now look, is that wise? We're talking about business here, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, she, she comes away with even more than she had brought, having come to establish a trade relationship with the king of Israel. The weight of gold that came to Solomon annually was 25 tons, and that was besides that, was brought by merchants and traders. All the Arabian kings, the governors of the land, brought gold and silver to Solomon. He made these 200 large shields of hammer. You got all this gold, what are you going to do with it? Okay. Well, I don't know, make some shields. So, <laughs> make these gold shields, and these gold shields uh, hanging in the house uh, the forest of Lebanon. Now that's mentioned elsewhere in the Bible. It was a building there in Israel. It basically what it was an armory. And so he's got these gold shields hanging in there. Uh, they would be used ceremonially. Now they're not used in battle. I mean we're talking about pomp and pageantry here. So you know when you when you you know when you're doing formal occasions you bring out the gold shields and all oh, this looks great. Okay. They wouldn't do you much good in battle because no. they were soft, you know, turned to nothing. Maybe if you could reflect the light, you know, that <laughs> might, might be somewhat effective, I don't know. But anyway, what is the point? The wealth. The king made this large ivory throne and overlaid it with pure gold. The throne had six steps, so steps going up to the throne. And a, 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 the footstool was made of gold. The seat was made of ivory and overlaid with gold, the armrest with lions on either side of the throne and lions on every step going down. So this is an artist's representation and I don't know how well you can see it, but can you just imagine here the way this is placed in the court in his palace? <clears throat> I mean, the artist envisions that there are a lot of people around, you know, in the palace, but this the, this, these steps um, lined with these lions creates an avenue 
to approach. So if you're going to approach the throne, you know, you're not just standing around it in a crowd. You're going to have to come around, and then you're going to have to go up. And, of course, the 12 lions would seem to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And the fact that there's a lion on each side of the throne, remember that in the Holy of Holies, over the Ark of the Covenant, there are two cherubim uh, that guard the presence of the Lord. There's a sort of a symbolic typology here with the two lions. They're, they're warring angels. That, that stand on either side of the king of Israel. Protection. So, <clears throat> So anyway, uh, he says, you know, this nobody had ever seen anything like this. This was opulent, fabulous. All of the drinking cups were gold, so on. There's no silver, there's nothing. Verse 21, the king's ships kept going to Tarshish. Here, just a comment here. Uh, Tarshish is in the west. Remember, uh, Jonah was going to go to the spoke, you know, got on a ship to go to Tarshish because he didn't want to go to Nineveh. It was going west in the opposite direction. Tarshish was over there near Gibraltar, basically over to Spain, you know. Okay. Um, so um, it sounds like he's got ships that are headed westward in the Mediterranean. I don't think that's the case. It's more likely that this phrase that's translated here, ships going to Tarshish, is really a reference to the kind of ship in Kings, the Kings account, 1 Kings 10, it's a reference, uh, he says, uh, ships made for Tarshish, which is a Tarshish ship, which is the kind that the Phoenicians used. It's these ships that they were using in um, the Red Sea, going down to Africa. I think that's what this is referring to. And notice all the things they bring back, gold, silver, ivory, apes, peacocks. So look, this is a stamp from Israel in 2016, that a commemorative stamp that was designed to illustrate this. Okay? I mean, it's only five Israeli shekels. Okay, put this stamp. <laughs> uh, new shekels. So <clears throat> there it is, a ship. Notice the peacock. Notice the apes. The apes probably are baboons uh, that they were bringing back. Spices, okay. Um, all kinds of spices, stones, all kinds of things that they were bringing back in their trade. So this was meant to illustrate that kind of thing. King Solomon surpassed all the kings of the world, riches and wisdom. All the kings of the world wanted an audience with him. They wanted to hear what the wisdom God put in his heart. Each of them would bring his own gift. So he was sought out. He was sought out. You know, um, you know, in diplomacy here, heads of state will sometimes consult with each other. You need to know who to consult with. Who's really wise? He's the guy to go to at that time. Of the various heads of state. He had 4,000 stalls of horses, chariots, 12,000 horsemen stationed them in chariot cities and with the king in Jerusalem. So this is a picture underneath the Temple Mount, the south end of the Temple Mount, where the stables of Solomon were discovered by archaeologists. Those are Solomon's stables. And uh, we also have um, archaeologists who have uncovered them at the fortified cities at Megiddo, Hatzor. Uh, we see the what are called the stables of Solomon, where the horses were kept. And he's ruling over the entire promised land from the Euphrates River as far as the border of Egypt. Now, Israel's not occupying all that land. He's ruling over the peoples who are in those lands, but he's ruling the boundaries of the promise. Silver is common as stones. Cedar is abundant as sycamore and Jean hit foothills. Cedar grew only in Lebanon. Um, 
the sycamore there is the sycamore fig tree that was growing natively in the uh, Shafalada, the, uh, the uh, coastal plain of Israel. Horses coming from Egypt all over. And here we come to the end. We're going to see this as we go through Chronicles. That The Chronicler refers to his sources. And he says, uh, if you want to read more about this, check out these books. Unfortunately, that was a long time ago. And the li they're not in the library anymore, okay? <laughs> They've been lost, okay? But he talks about the events of Nathan the prophet. I would love to read that book, okay? Uh, the, the, uh, the prophecy of Ahijah the Shalonite, okay? Well, uh, Kings also makes reference to these books. So they use these sources. These were prophets. You know, you know Nathan the prophet who spoke to David. And Ahijah, uh, we read about him more in Kings, who spoke to Solomon and to Jeroboam. Uh, we also have the visions of Ido the seer. I like that one. The visions of Ido. You know, check that one out. I mean, take that on vacation. The visions of Ido. You know? um, so, uh, especially concerning Jeroboam, son of Nebat. That's that's a little anticipation in the story because in Kings there's already discussion about Jeroboam at this point but the chronicler hadn't mentioned him he's not going to mention him until next week when we look at uh, Solomon's son Solomon reigned over Jerusalem in Jerusalem over Israel for 40 years Solomon rested with his fathers, was buried in the city of his father David. His son Rehoboam became king in his place. So we have three kings. Over on the left, that's an artist representation of David. Notice what David is doing and where he's looking. He's looking to God. Singing praises to the Lord. Solomon, look at the artist's representation. He's supposed to be a man of wisdom. So the artist is depicting him as the wise Solomon. He's thinking. It's his son, Rehoboam. Uh, Rehoboam, I don't know what the artist had in mind there. It looks kind of like a portrait, you know, looking off, kind of off-center, kind of at an angle. And that's what we're kind of going to see next week. He's not looking up, is he? And he's not thinking. <laughs> In fact, that's his problem. He didn't think. Okay. Uh, but anyway, we have a line of kings. Now, here's where I want to take us, and I want to ask you a question and get some comments and discussion. So turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 3. As you know, the Proverbs, uh, Proverbs 1.1, 1, 1, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. These are the Proverbs of Solomon. Look what he says here in Proverbs 3, verse 13, reading 3, 13 to 18. He says a lot about wisdom. So listen to what he says, Proverbs 3.13. Blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. For the gain from her is better than the gain from silver. And her profit is better than gold. She is more precious than jewels. And nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand and in her left hand are riches and honor. You see that? In her left hand are riches and honor. The right hand, long life, riches and honor. There's the wealth. And this is coming from wisdom, Solomon says. That's why wisdom is more precious than gold, because gold can be spent, but what do you got then? But wisdom, wisdom increases not only life, but more riches and honor. You can have riches without honor. You can have riches without life. 
you know, life without riches and without honor, okay? <laughs> but life, riches, and honor, he says, is coming from wisdom. Verse 17, her ways are the ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She's a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called blessed. Now Solomon goes on to talk about wisdom quite a bit in Proverbs. But I want to just reflect on this here. The relationship between wisdom and wealth. Wisdom, life, and honor. The Proverbs go on to say a lot about how the wicked are not able to understand how disaster comes. They, they can't see it because they're in the darkness. But the wise, the prudent, are able to see the path of life. And it includes the wealth and the riches. Now look, David was wise. And David had wealth. We read about it in Chronicles, but not like Solomon. There's several things to see here about wisdom, a wisdom of a nation, and the wealth of a nation. It's not just of a king, but of a nation. And one of the things you do see, I'm going to just throw out a couple of things and get your feedback on it, but one of the things that seems to me that you can see through this, as you trace this through the kings, is that the wealth that's associated with wisdom is not equal in every individual's life. However, it is a wealth that is enjoyed as a blessing with peace and with honor. And also, you see that the wealth grows, not only in an individual, but in a nation. So he moved the nation from David. Now David is an improvement over Saul, but we move from David to Solomon and the wealth is growing. <laughs> but the wisdom is transferred. So the wisdom is maintained from ruler to ruler, from generation to generation. There's a succession of walking in the wisdom and as that happens, the wealth grows. One of the problems is, and Proverbs deals with this, that it seems that the wicked are wealthy. In fact, there are examples that are given of the wealthy wicked. And the temptation is that the way that is not the way of the Lord, the way contrary to the way of the Lord, is really the way to wealth and honor and riches. But in actual fact, that way leads to disaster. Eventually, whether in a life or a people or a nation, that it will lead to disaster. There is only one way that leads to a constancy and an increasing and a successive type of wealth and honor, and that is the way of the Lord. That's the example of Solomon right here. Now, I want to throw that out to you here. We have uh, just a few minutes. Um, get your comments on that, comments on the passage, whatever comment you think of. <laughs> that you want to make or question or observation that you have. Donald? Yes, uh, Dr. Blazing, I want to say it now. Um, Sorry, we have a, we have a oh, mic now. <clears throat> so we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna use high tech. Yeah, there yeah. 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 we go. I wanted to, um, uh, this is our after work. To I think we gotta make stated. sure it's on. Turn it on. Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay, this is not directly uh, related to what you just stated. But it goes to um, Ethiopia. Yeah. And I'm thinking of the Ethiopian Jews. Um, I was in Israel, I think it was in 2007, and it was predominantly, you know, um, 
Jewish people as we know them today. Yeah. And I kept seeing these little groups of um, people of color. Yeah. So I asked our tour guide, because they kept popping out from different, I said, who are these people? He said, they're Jews. Yeah. You know, and um, I've been to Ethiopia twice, and Lord willing, maybe thinking about going in a couple of weeks again. Um, but the, the culture in Ethiopia is different than any other African culture that I've ever been to. And there is a strong connection to Israel. Mm -hmm. so, you know, of course, tradition traces it back to Solomon, to Sheba's visit to Solomon. Mm -hmm. um, I could believe that uh, you know, there is a connection beyond uh, between Solomon and Sheba, beyond what we see in the scripture based on the Ethiopian culture. And they don't yeah. say that all of the Ethiopians derive right. from the Jews, but, right. you know. They there is a group of Ethiopian Jews, and in fact, they're, they're, they, they petitioned for several years to be able to come to Israel. And, and so finally, um, you know, Israelis checked them out. <laughs> And lo and behold, they decided, yeah, they really are uh, sure. Jews. Sure. Um, so Jews in the dispersion, uh, you know, there, there was some intermarrying and so on. But nevertheless, there is this lineage. And so when you go to Israel today, you can see Ethiopian Jews who have immigrated become Israelis. And like you say, not all Ethiopians are. Of course, we remember the in Acts um, seven with Stephen, you know, sharing with the the OP Ethiopian who served Queen Candace uh, that uh, he takes the gospel back, and many become believers. And so, it's an interesting story. An yeah, interesting but he was a eunuch that yeah. kind of served her. Yeah, they think that. I don't really crew this that when. When she left, she was pregnant. The queen, well, yes, as it does deal with, you know, yes, who knows? I mean, you know, I mean, the, it's hard. It's one of them. Okay, yes, uh, Jack. As the Lord gave wisdom, he also, part of his wisdom was the talent of training your people of training your people what to do, but he did it in such a way as they had a good attitude or a fine attitude, mm -hmm. and that's why everything looks so well, it looks so good. Yeah. To me, that's a, a business principle is simply that if you treat your people well and you train them to do what you want to do, everything goes fine. Yeah. But that reverts back to to me, the Lord wants us to love one another yeah. and to be fair and honest to each other. Yeah, yeah it's very good. Thank you, Jack. The wisdom of interpersonal relationships in the business world. That's Absolutely. exactly, exactly right. Uh, Steve, right over here. Hawkins preached a sermon one time in that the uh, United States was living off the wealth of our inheritance essentially of generations before us and as you've been teaching through this I'm thinking about the loss of wisdom in our country uh, we had a great sense of innocence civil society in many, many areas. I mean, look at Chicago. It, it's nuts. But we still have great sums of wealth. But like you say, you can be wealthy without being wise. And when that happens, it doesn't last. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the thing. Dr. Blasey. Yes. 
to I, I was thinking about what you were saying you were talking about the shoes and gold pieces of fruit. And I, I, I can't remember which king it was that had to take down the shields of gold. Oh yeah, it's coming up this next week. This next week. Next. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, well, the trust, Anticipation. You know, the trust that comes with the wealth of women. I'm just talking about the United States and where we are. And Job says the trust can become a web, yeah. and that wealth can become something that holds us yes. like a spider's web. Oh yeah. We need to be used. Yeah. And that's why wisdom has to yes. go with it. Yes. Uh, so this is exactly the kind of thing we need to think about and evaluate. Now we've come to the end of our time, so let me just say this. You know, we're all, uh, many of you are aware, you know, in, in modern era here, national wealth, um, the philosopher who contributed to our understanding of that, Adam Smith, wrote The Wealth of Nations. Uh, and um, very important for understanding the, the development accumulation of wealth. What many people do not remember is they also wrote a book on morals and that a moral people were necessary for the development of the wealth of nations. It's not just moral, however. It's an honoring of God. And you remember how at the beginning of this passage what the Gentile noticed about Solomon is that he had built a house for God. <coughs> Let's pray together. Father, we do pray for our nation, yes. that our nation may seek the Lord, for you have granted wonderful blessings. But Lord, these blessings can only come from you. And you're the one who gives wisdom as well as wealth and honor and life. And Lord, we pray for our country that our people may seek the Lord. We pray for our, our leaders, our president, and the many leaders and the many levels of government that they may seek you and that you would grant wisdom to them. And Lord, we pray for your working in the hearts of our people, for life comes from you. Thank you for the wonderful grace that we have in the Lord Jesus in whose name we pray. Thank mm -hmm. you.